Hi everyone, greetings from Singapore. I am Claudia Chia from the South Asian Studies Program at the National University of Singapore. Today I'm very proud and happy to introduce Dr. Jayati Bharachaya for today's lecture. She is a senior lecturer at the South Asian Studies Program, NUS. She previously completed her PhD in Indian Business History from JNU in New Delhi. Before joining NUS, she worked as a visiting research fellow at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies, Yusuf Isha Institute here in Singapore. She has also earlier teaching experiences at the Qingdao University in China and at the Loreto College in Darjeeling. She enjoys teaching and find motivation and joy in interacting with diverse young minds. Her research interests and most of her publications are rooted in her interdisciplinary training in Indian business history. Besides writing journal articles and book chapters, she has published a book titled Beyond the Myth, Indian Business Communities in Singapore, which traces the origin, evolution and growth of the Indian business communities here in Singapore. She has also co-edited the volume titled Indian and Chinese Immigrants Communities, Comparative Perspectives. The book focuses on the lived spaces and interaction of the Indian and Chinese communities in different geopolitical contexts. Over the years, she has directed and expanded her research further into diaspora studies, South Asia and Southeast Asia relations, maritime linkages and connected histories in the Indian Ocean region. She is particularly interested in the transnational cooperation across the Bay of Bengal region. She explores the networks of people, trade, and ideas circulated in this space through different periods of time. On this topic, she has also initiated and led collaborative efforts with different scholars around the world and different institutions worldwide. Today, her lecture is titled Colonial Crossings, Rethinking Connectivities Across the Bay of Bengal. She will be speaking on her exploration about the alternative colonial narratives and the rethinking of this maritime space with a focus on the mobilities of the Indian business communities. I hope you will enjoy her lecture. Hello and greetings from Singapore. Thank you, Claudia, for that kind introduction. I'm very thankful to India International Center at Delhi for giving me this opportunity to share my research. Today, I would like to talk about the lesser known histories of the Indian business communities and how conventional historiography has shaped their mobilities in the colonial period across the maritime space of the Bay of Bengal. Now, this is going to be a very macro view of, um, uh, of my research and talking about challenges and opportunities. And I would also like to propose new paradigms of research to explore alternative narratives. The title of my presentation today, as you've heard, uh, is Colonial Crossings, uh, Rethinking Connectivities Across the Bay of Bengal. The much acclaimed work of Sunil Amrit, Crossing the Bay of Bengal, The Furies of Nature and Fortunes of Migrants, uh, which was published in 2013, begins with these words. The Bay of Bengal was once a region at the heart of global history. Um, I unquote. This was an acknowledgement that has been reiterated and evoked by a number of scholars, mostly since the beginning of the new millennium, addressing the need to look beyond several layers of boundaries that had been created in the maritime space since the colonial age. The carvings of different regional demarcations within Asia had become more pronounced with the post-colonial nation-centric discourses and the onset of the Cold War and got strongly embedded in enclosed regional blocks, both in academia and policy discourses. One can argue that these boundaries had started forming since the time when colonial agendas divided territories and arbitrarily bundled different population groups under a common governance and imposed identities. The spell of the rigid regional walls have certainly been disrupted, but surely did not disappear. In spite of new researches on maritimity, circulatory movements, diasporic interactions, connected histories, and borderland networks. Now, I would touch upon um, a few of the themes, as you can see um, here for discussion. 
Now, the Bay of Bengal has had long history of commercial and cultural circulation across its maritime space, which extended in both eastern as well as western directions. The Bay had remained an integral part of the shipping lanes in the Indian Ocean, one of the busiest since the age of the sailing ships. The trajectories of international trade in the colonial period, which has largely been the focus of researches on connectivities, have been dominated by Eurocentric narratives and, and facilitated by rich colonial archival sources. Um, um, the merchant communities uh, were very less represented unless they were they belonged to the European farms or global managing agency houses. Thus, the parallel circulation of intra-Asian trading networks, which also directly and indirectly was a part of the global trade circuit, have been totally marginalized, leaving an immense gap or opportunities in the scholarship on Asian colonial histories. Um, now, if we are looking at frameworks, um, my research on Indian business communities traverses beyond the frameworks of trade and commerce and explores into the idea of mobility, circulatory networks, connected histories, and diaspora studies. Uh, it also extends the boundaries of South Asian lenses for studying Indian business communities and incorporates local and indigenous sources of information as well as perspectives across this fluid space. The importance of including different sources for studying Indian communities beyond the lenses of South Asian approach had already been pointed out by scholars. And of course, they were of the opinion that the study of long range connections is likely to be incomplete without making use of sources from different countries. Now, the power and strength of Indian indigenous networks has often been underestimated, if not ignored, in the colonial narratives. Uh, of the ethnic business communities across the rims and the littorals of the Bay of Bengal. It was very easy to overlook and discount their existence due to lesser visibility or demographic presence in Southeast Asia, whether in Burma, modern Myanmar, or the Malayan Peninsula, modern Malaysia, and Singapore, particularly in comparison to the larger labor movements that dominated Indian migration histories since the early 20th century. The notions of the ethnic business communities were also oriented with the trajectories of their impermanence and were often categorized as either peddler merchants or sojourners. The transients was perhaps an important component of their circulatory networks and more often than not, a deliberate choice that emphasized on the importance of communities and networks and shared power equations and not on individual identities. Thus, there has been a lack of cognitive understanding of special and intra-community relationships that were far more deeply rooted than mere quantitative representation of identities and mobilities. Multi-site research on the scattered and diverse Indian business communities is certainly difficult, but creates opportunities for cross-disciplinary works and constructing non-elite and alternative narratives. So European mercantilism and its transformation into free trade policies and integration of the Asian market with the global economy led to an emergence of special architecture dotted with new ports like Calcutta, Colombo, Penang, and Singapore. It was also characterized by the bulk movement of commodities uh, like Bengal jute, Ceylonese coffee, Burmese rice, Malayan rubber, Javanese sugar and coffee, an unprecedented movement of people across this space. Between 1840 and 1940, about 8 million people traveled from India to Ceylon, and about 4 million to Malaya, and about 12 to 15 million to Burma, with around half of them returning within three to seven years. This maritime space of uh, the Bay was interspersed with two different kinds of circuits of trade and commerce. One was the inter-Asian trade around the rims of the Bay and the Euro-Asian trade stretching the lanes out both into East Asia as well as in the West to Africa and Europe. We have numerous academic publications on different paradigms of the port cities, maritime routes, 
water history, globalized networks of communities and commodities as part of Indian Ocean Studies. And a large part of these publications have been in a pre-colonial uh, context. Uh, and we also have, of course, a lot on contemporary geopolitical trajectories and which definitely requires a different dialogue altogether. Um, recent scholarship recognizes empires as I quote from Lynn Lees, uh, who worked on, on British Malaya. Uh, she says, um, I quote, spaces of flow structures within which individuals maintain complex allegiances and sense of belonging, unquote. And this was instead of characterizing empires conventionally with inflexible categories of homogeneous hierarchical power structures. The transnational connect connections, pluralistic nature of the empires, which in turn mobilized diasporic movements are reflected in works of many scholars like Enseng Ho, Lin Holland Lees, uh, Sugata Bose, Sunil Amrit, amongst others. However, the fluid nature of framework of circulation presents both opportunities and challenges. While it offers scope of uh, different dimensions of multidisciplinary research, fitting it within the frames of a neatly structured analysis may be arduous. For example, components of trade were determinants of interactions between regions and communities, irrespective of religious affiliations or political governance. But at the same time, different merchant groups acted as sponsors of religious networks. Markowitz, um, Claude Markowitz, both in his seminal research on the Sindhi communities and also on other Asian merchant networks, highlights this dynamic circulatory flow of credit, capital, goods, and mail. The same existed in the pre-colonial period. Um, got reshaped in the colonial centuries and found resonances in post-colonial period as well. These several circuits that then emerge in the bigger Venn diagram of the Bay with several convergences and interjections at different nodes. The Euro-Asian and Inter-Asian trade circuits are two major circulatory networks that operated with numerous overlaps in this hydrospace, creating special moments of uh, economic and cultural encounters, accommodations, resiliences between foreign and indigenous players. So these are some of um, the circuits that I have tried to draw. This is a very, very simple um, map. And of course, there is a much complex wave of circuits and I'm trying to develop this map further. So these are just um, you know, uh, pointing to um, uh, sort of joining the dots across the different um, port cities that emerged during the colonial period. Um, uh, my next section is about coll collaborations and power strategies, which I think is, was very, very important. And we must give our attention to the kind of strategies that sort of um, interplayed with um, different sort of power hierarchies um, sort of was imposed by the colonial rulers, as well as kind of negotiations that were going on. So two parallel modes of power hierarchies prevailed through which the colonial authorities operated. With primary concerns of pursuing and enhancing trade prospects, the East India Company, on the one hand, created opportunities for accommodation and cooperation from Indian merchant bodies and traders without whom it was impossible to carry on their trading functions. They supplied the necessary capital on many occasions and were helpful in sourcing different products. The collaboration and accommodation However, differed dif in different moments of colonial history, depending on the political grasp of the on the governance of India and other Asian states. In India for the 17th and the 18th century, commercial interactions with European merchant communities was only a small part of the activities of the indigenous merchant communities. Um, I can give you examples of Jagat Seth in Bengal and the names of Malay Chatti, Kasi Vidanna, Sunkar Ramachetti from the Coromandel Coast, who acquired significant position of power and influence as merchants and bankers with the downfall of the Mughal Empire and became indispensable for the new regimes in the different parts of the subcontinent. However, these equations had changed by 
um, by the end of the 19th um, century with increasing inflow of foreign merchants and extension of British power towards the East in Burma and Malaya. The dependence on native merchants declined with better familiarity with the Asian commercial world. The introduction of modern postal network as an alternative to the complex Kundi system and implementation of uniform currency by the company, which crippled the money changing business. Of course, the Hundi system did not definitely die out and it remained very much active within the intra community uh, networks amongst the indigenous businesses. Um, the, the British agency houses then took over. And uh, I will just give you examples of just two firms. One firm by the name of Calcutta Palmer and Company, which was, which was established in 1810 in Calcutta, which diversified into shipping, insurance, general trading. Um, um, it established the Calcutta Bank and also ventured into publication business, bringing out the Calcutta Journal and uh, reaped huge gains in the China trade and the coastal trade. And it was often called um, the, the opium king or the indigo king. Uh, in Madras, there was similar and uh, another similar name of Chase and Perry, uh, which later became Perry and Company, which was originally established in 1789. And they established a tannery in Madras, sourced raw materials from Penang, Colombo, Cape of Good Hope, and supplied leather goods to the army. The European agency houses in the 19th century thus disrupted and displaced the Indians and Arabs in the coastal trade in the Indian Ocean. However, dependence on a certain group of native merchants remained due to unfamiliarity of land language and culture. These agents became indispensable and responsible for sourcing, purchase, shipment, quality control, etc. for the agency houses. A convenient but hierarchical relationship between the European masters and the natives gave rise to what came to be known as the Bania class. Dijwendi Tripathi has um, written a lot on the Banias um, that have emerged. And uh, in one of uh, his publications by, um, along with Jyoti Jumani, he suggested that the Bania was the linchpin of the entire operation. Now, this was a new category different from the established genres of merchants and traders with fluidity in their occupational roles. So they were, you know, transiting between being Doba, or interpreter, company clerks, and also being Banias. A much cited example is that of Narayana Pillay, an interpreter and clerk from Penang, who accompanied Raffles to Singapore in 1819, and later became one of the founding merchants and entrepreneurs in building up the island city. Other examples of anglo banya order were the lucrative agency houses that were set up in collaboration with the European capital, like Cartagor and Company, Oswald Seal and Company, Rustam G. Turner and Company. And there were some very interesting names that came up, uh, particularly in Bengal, like Motilal Seal, Dwarkanath Tagore, Ashutosh De, Ram Gopal Ghosh, who were very promising indigenous entrepreneurs during the early part of the 19th century, but this phase was unfortunately short-lived and declined by 1850s. So the traditional merchant groups manifested more sustenance in the onslaught of imperial economic discourse. Um, along with certain attempts uh, towards unavoidable collaborations and accommodations, Indian mobilities, both voluntary and involuntary, were also victims of well-crafted colonial strategies of governance, dominance, and discrimination that led to different dimensions in economic planning and determined paradigms of interracial interactions. The colonial agendas divided or fused territories together or grouped people under common governance, like putting Burma and Malaya under the East India Company's seat of power in Calcutta during the first half of the 19th century. Now, Burma was only separated uh, from the Bengal presidency um, much later in 1937, but um, um, Penang and Singapore um, from Malaya, of course, um, were made into straight settlements in 1867. While the Indian subcontinent was subjected to what has been debated as a drain of wealth and served as a major source of raw materials and a large market for finished products, um, Singapore was separated from its Malaysian hinterland and promoted as a global trading hub with opportunities of free trade for all immigrant communities and enabling a smooth traffic for the China trade. 
Singapore's development came at the cost of Penang's downfall as a commercial center and a port that was tactically planned um, by the colonists. Penang then remained mostly confined to intra-Asian trading activities. At the same time, rice and rubber was strategized as cash crop based economic models for Burma and Malaya respectively, leading to cultivation and commodification of these products on an industrial scale. Indians being closely connected with the British administrative machinery took up roles as employees in the British contingent, as recruits in the army, security personnel, teachers, lawyers, bureaucrats, and also in policing activities. One could envisage the advantage of the Indians in working closely with the British, which, however, with certain exceptions, succumbed to the master narrative created by the colonists in creating divergences and boundaries between races and the people. At the other end of the spectrum was the huge exodus of well-maneuvered Indian migrant laboring population on which several studies have been made by scholars like Arasaratnam, uh, Sandhu, A. Mani, Turnbull, and more recently by Amrit that blended well with the prevalent, prevalent historiography of labor-centric labor migration trends. There was a difference in treating different racial groups of labor migrants as well. In Singapore, for example, whereas the Indian labor migration was more structured and controlled by the British in the later half of the 19th century, the Chinese immigrant worker, um, he was free to find his own job after having served his employer for a year. This deliberate distinction made the position of Indian and Chinese laborers quite distinct in the same lived space. The minority and voluntary migrant merchant communities, the least studied among them, all the mobile groups, were sometimes facilitated uh, to expand into Southeast Asia and East Asia, like the Chetiars and the Parsis, whereas the Sindhis assumed a more globetrotting status after the British annexation of the same. And of course, the Gujaratis and Chulias kept up with the historical continuities of their connections in the region. Thus, the movement of the people was hardly organic, except for the small group of merchant communities who maintained very low profiles and mostly avoided contestations with the imperial order. However, also faced the wrath of the local population in perceived alignment with the colonial governance. The term Kling or Bengali was directed as Indians in Malaya in a very derogatory tone, whereas the Chetyars in Burma were later driven out after the withdrawal of the British. Now uh, we'll move on to um, looking, uh, having a close look at a few of um, the merchant communities here. And um, um, I'm going to very fleetingly discuss some of the communities um, who were uh, mobile at the, in this space. Um, if we begin with the Chulias and the Gujaratis, I've just mentioned that they followed with historical continuities and they were not newcomers in this region. Um, for example, when um, Francis Light, um, you know, um, uh, landed up in Penang and, and uh, founded uh, Penang as a trading port. Uh, the Chulias then came in from Kedah, which was another place in the Malayan archipelago and not essentially from the Coromandel coast. Also in Singapore, we find a very interesting fact that uh, the first um, uh, space that was designated to the Indians under Raffles Town planning was um, the Chulia Street, which, was, which is still there, and it is right in the heart of the business district, and not necessarily the Serangoon Road or the Little India, which it came to be known as later on, um, which is most commonly perceived. So the Chulias were there um, in much earlier since the pre-colonial times and continued with their activities with renewed negotiations in this space under the British colonial hegemony. Um, about the Gujaratis uh, were uh, also pretty much uh, present in different parts of Southeast Asia and as well as in Africa. And there were various subgroups um, um, amongst the Gujaratis like the Memons, Kachis, Bohras, and various others 
who migrated either to the same lived space or to different uh, spaces um, across um, the Bay of Bengal. Chettiars, on the other hand, of course, were uh, following the footsteps of the colonial expansion, and they mostly uh, settled in different places of Southeast Asia and also some parts of Africa. Um, they were more famous as moneylenders, local bankers, and investors. And similarly, the Parsis were very much involved in the uh, China trade. Uh, the Sindhis also uh, sort of followed the British expansion roots. Uh, however, they did not confine themselves uh, to uh, Southeast Asia or East Asia. Um, and this is a hand-drawn map, um, uh, as you can see on this slide. Um, but the Sindhis were also quite a globe-trotting diaspora, and they were uh, traversing around different other parts of the globe as well. Right? And uh, the Punjabis came much later on, and particularly in Singapore, I find that uh, they were much involved in the sports goods, goods business. And sometimes um, many of them who were originally involved in policing activities and, secure, and uh, posted as security guards also had a kind of a part-time occupation of money lending activities. And by accumulating a little bit of wealth, they then invested this in small time and medium level businesses. Um, um, uh, but we do find the, the mobilities of uh, the Punjabis um, gaining much more momentum after the partition in 1947. Um, so they did have all these um, business communities had their own very, very close intra-community networks which were uh, used for sourcing different products, for um, their financial uh, relations between uh, them within the community, also for human resource uh, distribution networks. And um, it is also an, another interesting story uh, to see how the Sindhis participated um, in the, uh, the Japanese textile production and distribution market across uh, in South, the, South Asia, uh, South and Southeast Asia, and giving a very tough competition to the Lancashire products. Well, that is a story which has not been told, and, and uh, it's a very interesting story indeed. Um, if we um, look at some of the um, important ports, and I mention only three here, uh, important colonial ports and all on the um, uh, western part of the Malayan archipelago. Uh, Penang and Singapore and Rangoon and out of these three um, uh, the, the large number of uh, the maximum number of Indian immigrants uh, that uh, were uh, posited uh, um, and that moved uh, was in Rangoon and here we have one um, uh, Burmese scholars saying that Rangoon was virtually an Indian city with immigrants playing a major role in trade and commerce. Um, it, was, it was very interesting to see how these, uh, the Indian communities um, got uh, embedded as a part of the diaspora in these uh, port cities. Um, the three different nodes of commerce across the Bay um, comprised of overlapping networks of inter-Asian and Asia Europe trade circuits. Uh, of the three, um, Singapore emerged as the most prosperous and carried on the colonial legacy to emerge as one of the most prominent global cities today. Penang and Singapore were promoted by the British as strategic commercial and um, commercial connectors in the China trade, with the latter eventually being given more priority in terms of infrastructural and commercial developments. Rangoon progressed with a different character of its own with its huge hinterland, historical overland trade routes, all three being governed from the East India um, Company's headquarters in Calcutta till the Strait Settlements um, was formed in 1867, uh, comprising of Singapore, Pen uh, Penang, and Malacca. Thus, in the age-old Malay-speaking western rims of the Malay archipelago, where key positions such as the Saudagar Raja or the Royal Merchant and Shabandar, Lord of the Port, were held by foreign merchants or trade diasporas. And in most cases, they were the South Asian merchants. Strong intra-Asian connectivities were supplanted with British 
colonial flavors. Um, a quick look at um, the, uh, the population of Indians in these three ports. And uh, with the figures of Rangoon, you can see it was pretty overwhelming in comparison to the others. Now, uh, an important point of discussion is shaping of historiographies. You know, this is something that I want to um, talk about, about how uh, the Asian commercial interactions were being restructured and how historiography uh, has shaped that kind of emerging narrative. Uh, while the Bay continued to remain the web of maritime highways, the commodities, commercial centers, directions of trade, hierarchies of power equations all shifted gears in the imperial project. Calcutta, Madras, Rangoon, Penang, Singapore displaced earlier commercial nodes like Masuli Patanam, Chittagong, Mraukwu or Arakan, Aceh, Johor, Malacca, and Makassar. The colonial ports were mostly built with new socio-political and economic alignments, architectural designs, structured allocation of lift spaces, formatted town planning, and of course, new mindset. Thus, while Singapore, Penang, and Rangoon were all important ports and nodes of imperial commerce in the um, 19th and 20th century, Rangoon um, was geographically very distinct with its overland and maritime connections with both South and Southeast Asia. It is also interesting to observe that Lower Burma gained new significance in the colonial consciousness that the seat of economic and political power shifted from previously more important Upper Burma, the seat of governance for the Burmese kings. Burma was also ecologically intertwined with the riverine arteries of the Irrawaddy that flowed from north to the south. However, the indigenous understanding of the geographical and cultural distinction between Sunar Paranta, north and west of Iravadi, and Tambadipa, south and east of Iravadi, was reinstituted into ethnic differences between the Burmans in the Upper Burma and the Mon-speaking people in Lower Burma. Now added to this new framework was the disproportionate domination of Indians in Burma's colonial enterprise. The large inflow of migrants ranged from unskilled and semi-skilled laborers and coolies, sepoy communities, professional employees to commercial classes, including the Natukotai Chetias from the Coromandel coast, as well as Gujaratis, Sindhis, Marwari merchants from the north, and also Parsi merchants from the western coast of the Indian Peninsula. For Penang and Singapore, the indigenous alignment with the colonial project manifested in the making of the Straits Chinese, who were dominant entrepreneurial community in Southeast Asia, while strong legacies of this ethnic dominance prevailed in a post-colonial makeup of Singapore and in Malaysia and Myanmar, it gave rise to rising sentiments of ethno-nationalism that resulted in Dobama and Thakin movements in the later colonial period in Burma and consequent trajectories of Burmanization and eventual Indophobia uh, leading to mass return of Indians by 1960s. Similarly, in Malaysia, the Bhumiputra or the son of the soil issue created ethnic tensions irrespective of intangible acculturation process over several hundred years that had taken deep roots in different aspects of language, food, religion, and cultural spaces. The labor-centric narratives of the Indians in the British colonial project in South Asia have been too often discussed as the dominant framework of migration analysis and eventual understanding of lived spaces across the Bay. Uh, following the Western framework of discourses, uh, many Asian scholars have further explored and created new subaltern narratives of the demographically dominant laboring Indian population in Southeast Asia. It resulted in the marginalization of the once prominent and prosperous circulation of the Indian trade diasporas across the maritime space, which was subsumed under the hegemonic imperial economic project. Yet they thrived and sometimes prospered, leaving quite prominent markers in different lived spaces. The post-colonial state narrative have also mostly uh, followed the labor history frameworks, 
Thus, if we consider the space of Little India in Singapore, it was not the originally designated space, as I've just mentioned, um, given to the Indians in Singapore under Raffles Town Planning, but it was a Chulia Street in the Central Business District um, and for the merchant communities. Serenkun Road area developed as the Indian settlement much later, um, and it was actually uh, promoted as uh, the labor lines uh, which were housed there uh, in and around that space and uh, which comprised of predominantly uh, prominent Tamil force. And um, thus there was an overflow of shopkeepers and traders from the center of court to this region. And thus it emerged as a sort of an Indian space much, much later. And now um, in this map, which is um, in one of the panels in the Indian Heritage Center in, in Singapore, it shows one of the early settlements of Singapore. And as you can see uh, here, um, the High Street, the Upper Cross Street, the Chulia Street, the Market Street, um, the um, you know, South Bridge Road, Tanjong Pagar, all had Indians residing in these spaces. Of course, there was also the Dhobi Ghat and the Serangoon Road and the Putong Pasi where um, Arab streets uh, uh, Indians were there. So the marking of Indian heritage space in the Serangoon Road area as a part of creating Singapore's national narrative has cemented as strong footprints of the colonial discourse. Now, um, I would like to share uh, a few visuals of tangible and intangible heritages and the footprints and the strong footprints that it has left. Um, and and these, are, these are all pictures from Singapore. Um, and um, all, all sort of representing different business spaces. Um, uh, on, on top, uh, you can see Little India, anybody who has visited Singapore would have perhaps gone to this place. And this has uh, maintained, uh, this has been maintained as a major tourist attraction and a heritage space um, representing the Indian um, diaspora in this in Singapore and as you can see the the facade of the shop house structure remains uh, in the inner core of the place and um, the new buildings can be seen only in the outer core um, and new buildings are not allowed to be built in the inner core just maintaining this the, the facade of the shop house structures um, just below is another uh, picture of um, the Raffles place which is right in the middle of uh, the central business district of Singapore. And there is one Bharat building standing tall, which houses uh, Yuko Bank and the Indian Bank there. Um, this, is, this is a place which is much less discussed in the narratives. Of course, with the new diaspora coming in, you have a lot of Indians who are professionals and who, um, you know, Raffles Place is their place of work. So you do find a lot of Indian, um, Indians in and around this place. Uh, the picture on the right is also very interesting, where um, um, which is um, in Boat Key, which is alongside uh, Singapore River. Again, a very important tourist place um, of visit. And if one has visited uh, Boat Key, you cannot, um, you know, miss out on these statues. There were several of these statues uh, which represent uh, different ethnic groups. Uh, and also talk about, uh, you know, reminding residents and tourists alike uh, about the colonial heritages of Singapore. In this particular visual, we can see um, there's some sort of a conversation happening between a Chetiar with his um, famous red book in front and, uh, um, and a Chinese, supposed to be businessman, who is on his abacus. Um, so again, interesting pictures. Um, I also find um, cuisines and food practices to be very, very interesting footprints of heritage. And uh, this one particular, I would like to share with you this uh, particular uh, restaurant, which is called the Banana Lake Apollo, uh, which is situated um, right in the heart of Little India on the main food street, which is on the West Coast Road. And, uh, it, um, you know, it has been there since 1974 and it is continuing with the tradition of serving fish head curry, which is a very Singaporean dish, but um, it had been sort of innovated by uh, a person from uh, Kerala uh, who had looked at the Indian and Chinese fish preferences and sort of 
um, brought different sort of cuisines together, amalgamated together in uh, the shape of the fish head curry, which is very different from anything um, that we know in South Asia. So uh, this is one of the, um, uh, this is a Sing uh, Singaporean Indian owner. And uh, um, the, you have, as you can see from the visual, there is um, a lot of different sort of ethnic groups who are enjoying the meal here. Another uh, very interesting space that uh, I find is that of, this is again a business space uh, in the middle of um, Little India. Uh, and that is of the jewelry business. Uh, I have done a separate study on Indian jewelry business and their transition uh, from the Indian ownership to, to Chinese ownership and, and how that has shaped up over generations. Um, but just to very briefly let you know, this is again, as you can see, this is the visuals of uh, facade um, of the shop art structures where these shops are housed. Animani Porchalai, um, as you can see, the Indian uh, gold shop over here, uh, is a very, very old name, perhaps um, originating sometimes in 1940s. Uh, it has changed hands, ownership, actually, but the name has not changed, thus drawing in, you know, um, uh, the older clients also. Um, but it has been taken, uh, I mean, of course, the, the times have changed and uh, uh, you don't find a goldsmith as you would find earlier in the shops, housed in the shops, who then catered individually to families and individual clients and customizing their jewelries, just like what happened in South Asia. Now, of course, it has been taken over by uh, much of machine-made jewelry, and uh, a lot of ownership has been taken over by the Chinese uh, gold jewelry businessmen, who, however, in this space, they are selling, very interestingly, they sell uh, Indian jewelries and cater to Indian clients or South Asian clients. And um, uh, I find this very interesting because um, as you can see right uh, along with Animani Portulai, you have another Chinese um, jewelry shop here. And the signboards are especially interesting where you have uh, the name of the shop written in English, in Tamil, and if it's a Chinese owner, also in Chinese. And um, if we look at the, um, at the kind of the jewelries, that are available and it is it is very interesting you know i wouldn't um, if, if i i had not known for sure that these pictures are personally taken by me uh, it would be hardly it would be very difficult to believe that they were not from south asia so but these are all pictures from you know from from little india from the gold shops available in little india so with that, we come to the reflections. Uh, and um, here I would just like to highlight a few things. Um, the diasporic Indian communities present a complex and a layered process of acculturation and assimilation that have long lasting legacies into the contemporary period. Uh, I have limited my discussion in the Northern region of the Bay mostly, and also uh, only referred to three more significant ports during the colonial period, thus merely opening the door of enormous research possibilities that remain unexplored. However, scholars often face a dearth of sources regarding Indian business communities who prefer to maintain a very low profile and remain obscure. Unlike the Chinese business groups, there's a lack of record keeping habit and hesitation to share family papers, if there are any. One has to rely heavily on the colonial archival records for primary sources of information and are often bounded by it. It has remained fundamental to our understanding and shaping of research findings, thus also limiting our knowledge and perceptions in a certain sense. I think it is important to consider a shift in the methodology and paradigm of Indian networks and discourses across the space. I propose to promote new directions which may mobilize research findings uh, one is to open ourselves to collaborations between Asian scholars and make use of available vernacular sources in rethinking about the scope of such a research. Second, to, um, to create alternative and new archives, that is a community archives or thematic archives to include oral histories of diasporic communities 
collate travelers' narratives, diaries, artist expressions to map the time and space in a more tangible way. By making use of the technological advancements, one can also envisage creation of digital platforms to make this attempt more participatory amongst different communities and across state borders. Thus, not only addressing to bridge uh, what has often been called the scholarly fault line uh, between South and Southeast Asian studies, but also disseminating and sharing knowledge beyond the academia, thus exploring connected histories with a fresh approach. With that, I come to the end of my presentation. Um, but before I go, I would like to share um, with uh, you all uh, an initial collaborative attempt that we've taken in mobilizing and rethinking about Bay of Bengal. And this was an initiative, this was a joint effort along with uh, one of my colleagues at NUS. Um, this is the first page of the focus section of the IIS newsletter number 85, which was published in spring 2020, where different scholars, uh, both uh, South and Southeast Asianists, anthropologists and historians, uh, attempted to converge between, uh, beyond the impermeable borders and the nationalistic rhetoric. Um, this newsletter is an open uh, source publication available easily on internet and perhaps it will uh, make an interesting reading to some of you. Um, on the right, as you can see, I have just put in the, um, um, the contents of what is in this section and uh, the, the contributors uh, and their title of the papers that they have contributed in this section. With this, I come to the end of today's discussion. Um, do write to me if you, with your comments uh, or queries um, or any suggestions you, if you may have. And, um, and, and my email is given in the very first slide. So, um, and you can also find me on the NUS website. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you. <laughs>